few anecdotal reports from users that, oh, this found a problem in my code, which is, which is great. The main information page, or sort of the landing pad for, for information on it, is on the GCC wiki, on the static analyzer page. And that, um, and that has links to the documentation, and every time I add a new feature or fix a major problem, I, I put a note in there, there's a sort of history of the project in there. The initial release in GCC 10 added 15 warnings, control bear, mostly related to memory, so memory leaks, use after free, and so on and so forth. And each release, we've added more warnings. Um, and currently, for GCC 13, um, 42 warnings, um, and hopefully more than that by the time we actually release. 42 is a good number, I agree. <laughs> but 43 would be better, uh, and, you know. Um, the more the better, I feel. Uh, so before I talk about um, the analyzer, there are various improvements I've made to the diagnostic subsystem as a whole. So this, the stuff I'm going to talk about now applies to all errors and warnings, not just those coming from the analyzer. Uh, in GCC 9, I added, well, traditionally, errors and warnings, the output from, to, the, to the user or to the, the from GCC has been, we spew out a bunch of text to standard error, saying there's a problem here, there's a problem there. And as we've made the output richer and richer and conveying more and more detailed information, it gets more and more unreasonable to ex well, that, that output is intended for humans, and people have written regular expressions and other type things to try and carve up that output and make it machine readable. But there's a tension between, as we make the, that information richer and more interesting, for example, we're showing execution paths through the code, you don't want to be parsing, uh, trying to parse that. You need a machine-readable format. So in GCC 9, I added dash F diagnostics format equals JSON. And if you use that, it, instead of the usual text format, it emits um, a JSON representation of the diagnostics to standard error. And that, that was just a custom format I invented that fairly closely re resembles the GCC's internal representation of the diagnostics. Uh, and so for GCC 13, um, I've added an alias for that, uh, diagnostics format equals JSON stood error, so that I can also, I found it was kind of clunky because you, in a build, you, you would have to kind of redirect things and capture it, um, the various outputs if you're trying to get the, what are all the problems across the whole of the build. Uh, so I added a format equals JSON file, which outputs to a file based on the source file name. So you could then go, go in and then say, what, write a script to gather all the problems in the build. And, and that's good, but the, um, there's a new standard, well, it's not so new anymore, that's emerging from uh, Microsoft have been championing this called Serif, which stands for the Static Analysis Results Interchange Format, which sort of does what it says. Uh, it's a JSON-based file format. Uh, I think there's a 300-page specification, um, which arguably is 100 pages, well, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very detailed specification, but it has a lot of functionality in it uh, where you can express the results of analysis of a, both text files, such as source files, and also binary files. You can, say, you can do things like, if you're writing a virus checker, you can, you can express that these bytes here match a particular known bad signature. Um, so you can express ranges of bytes and things like that. Um, you can express fix-it hints for potential fixes to the code. You can, express you can express the sort of execution path information. You can even do multi-threaded execution path information to say, this stuff is happening on this thread, and then this thing happens on this thread, and boom, we've got a race condition or problem. And the idea being that you have producers of this of this information, static analysis tools, or just compilers, or you know, virus checkers, and so on. And, um, and Microsoft have added a whole bunch of, of tooling into GitHub, I believe, so that it's this. So it, seem, it seems a decent enough standard, and so it seemed a good one to support. And so I've added diagnostics format equals um, serif studera and serif file, similar to the JSON options. And um, here is where I show you a screenshot of Visual Studio. So this is 
a um, Visual Studio Code, in fact, which as I understand is the open source version of Visual Studio. And this is showing a double free bug where, um, so Visual Studio has a, oh, Visual Studio Code has a serif extension for viewing, uh, sort of a mode for viewing uh, serif files. And here it's showing, yeah, we've got the source code and uh, line five, um, yeah, if, we, if the flag, if flag is true and the fir you know, we go into the block, the free is called and then free is called again outside the if condition. And so this is output from the GCC static analyzer that's been emitted as a serif file being visualized and showing here's the, you, you can see the yellow text at the top is showing step one following the true path. So that's information emitted by the GCC static analyzer. And you can again see the analysis steps in a tab in the bottom half of the screen. Now what I'm hoping is that there, is, that there are some Emacs hackers in the room who can implement an Emacs mode for this. Um, because hey, why, you know, Visual Studio shouldn't have all the fun. Um, so, um, but there are other things that it can do, like, uh, as I say, fix it hints, so that you can put little, it, you can, it, the IDE can put little underlines under the code, and you can say, there's a problem here, fix it, and you click on it, and it fixes it. Um, and, and in fact, if we wanted to do that in Emacs, there's already an environment variable we can set that makes GCC emit machine readable fix it information to standard error as part of its normal thing. So that's an easier way of doing it. Might be an easier way for Emacs to implement that. But if you're an Emacs hacker, please come talk to me because I'm very, I use Emacs and I want to be able to use this stuff. Um, so the, that was, that's sort of talking about GCC as a producer of this format, about being able to save um, diagnostics, for example, static analysis warnings, but warnings and errors in general in a build into a machine readable format. And sort of the other side of that would be GCC as a consumer of this information. Oh, sorry. And being able to play back, um, excuse me, being able to play back um, diagnostics. So, um, I, 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 um, so the stuff I just showed you is in GCC trunk for GCC 13. I posted a patch kit back in June to try and do replay. And the idea is, so for example, here is a serif file from, I think it's ESLint, which is a JavaScript linter. And the, and the idea is, well, we can do GCC example.serif, and it replays using GCC's diagnostic printing routines. Um, like, and here is an error in this JavaScript file. Um, and there are some issues with it, which is how do you find, if, for, for example, quoting the source files um, and there's sort of a nasty logic about are the paths in the serif file relative to the build or are they relative to the path of the, the serif file? And exactly how do you express, like, I want to do a build, I want to gather all the information, and then, um, you know, do I want to present this sort of... Because I guess the idea for this is for generating reports about a build. You want to sort of gather all the information, all the problems in a build, and sort of gather them up and like present them in the, the use cases like sort of presenting them in some sort of UI so we can mark not a problem, not a problem, or and compare them against earlier runs and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and I'm not quite sure exactly how some of that patch should work. So I posted that and um, I don't know if that's going to get into 13 because I'm, I'm not sure of some of the answers to that, but this seems interesting and worth mentioning. So that was talking about improvements to the um, analyzer, sorry, in, the improvements to the GCC diagnostic subsystem in general. And this applies to all errors and warnings. Now I'm going to talk about improvements to the static analyzer component. Um, and so we've got a whole bunch of new warnings. Um, I implemented four new warnings relating to um, var var variadic arguments in C, the studarg.h. Um, so, the, uh, hopefully that is readable. The, so, the first one is doing type checking of um, varargs, where we have a, a function that um, passes, uh, I guess, a format string and a, an int. Uh, I guess 1066 was my int. I don't know why I picked that. And to um, so a function consume long. And because the analyzer can 
analyze interprocedurally. It can analyze from the call site. It's been passed an int as a var arg. And then at the varg um, thing, it's trying to consume it as a long. And as I understand it, it will just scrape data off the stack and get garbage. And so that's a problem for the, like, it might be trying to extract 64 bits when there's only 32 bits there. And because we've got this interprocedural analysis, we can go from the call site, hopefully all the way down into the varag passing, and get that and, and find type mismatches that way. So it's sort of a way of getting dash w format for free, in air quotes, um, for, um, for general uh, but getting it from the source rather than from um, having to hard code it inside GCC's implementation of, uh, uh, of uh, say, this is a particular format string or, or whatnot. So that's the, sorry, that's the dash W analyzer VAR type mismatch. So my, my, my option names tend to be quite long, um, but, um, well, they're, they're descriptive, I guess. Um, and then the next one is VA list exhausted, where I, I have my, um, I'm passing it, consume n ints, and this one takes how many ints to consume? Let's consume two of them, and let's pass, oops, only one of them to the, the function. And you can see it goes into the loop and it analyzes. We go into the loop, we follow a true branch to there, then we follow back to the top of the game, we go the second time in, oops, no more arguments, one consumed. I think what I should be doing probably is showing each VARG call in that execution part. So you can see here's the first argument being consumed and now we try and consume the second and there isn't one there. And boom, we've, I believe what will happen is it'll just read garbage from the stack. Um, well, I guess it depends on exactly how VARG is implemented on the particular target. But so it is a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't, I don't complain about um, surplus arguments because that isn't a problem in general. But this will, um, as I say again, it's got that sort of interprocedural link between the call site and the implementation, assuming that the, the, the analyzer can see both, uh, both, uh, both functions. Uh, so now that's if you run out of arguments. The next one is. Yeah, you need to call VA end on any VA arg that you've acquired, either by VA start or, and here's an example where you, we do a VA start, then we VA copy it to create a second copy of the argument um, um, list. And when we fall off the end of the function, and it can say, yeah, the VA copy was called here at event one, and at event two, we fall off the end of the function, goes out of scope, and we've, but we've forgotten to call VA end on that one that was created at event one. Uh, so that's, we can complain about that leak, which depending on how VARG is implemented on the target, that could be a genuine resource leak. I think it, it's a target dependent thing. And VA list use after VA end, which is, yeah, you call VA start, VA, do some stuff, VA end, and then if you do a VARG after you've called VA end, we can uh, complain about that um, because presumably it might have been, I don't, again, this potentially is a crash depending on how VAR has been implemented on, and it, you know, it might not be on a particular target, but on other targets it might be. So those are the variadic argument things I've added. That's all in trunk for, um, for, for GCC 13. I've added a, a, a couple of new ones. I already had testing for jump through an uninitialized pointer, and then I realized, well, I probably should be testing for jumps through null pointers as well. So that was a fairly trivial one to add. Um, and I've got an, I have an example where I have a sort of a struct with lots of callbacks, and uh, what you can't see in here is there's a mem set to zero out the whole struct, and maybe there's some initialization happens, and then we call, the, call it the on redraw callback, and it hasn't been initialized. Well, it hasn't been changed from null, so it's a jump through null. I probably should show this is where the null comes from, and exactly how I'm generating execution paths to visualize in the, you know, to the user could use some improvement, and I've been dabbling with a rewrite. Um, right now, the way I do that is heavily favoring the sort of the state machine part of state tracking. It tries to visualize, it tries to show the user state changes that are, are, that are pertinent. And I've been sort of trying to refactor that, but um, it's a fairly major job. And I don't 
well, I hope to do it at some point, but I don't know if I'll make it for GCC 13. So this is where the null comes from. Uh, but I'm, so I'm, as you can see, it, 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 it finds it, and hopefully the user can then figure out where that's coming from. But ideally, it would show that where the null value for that, um, that, that callback field would have come from. Um, and then um, this, 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 this is a shameless Clang does it, so we should do it too. Um, warning: um, Put M of auto var. Um, and here we have, um, yeah. If you put M takes a pointer, and it, as I understand it, 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 there is a global environment array of pointers inside a process, and and put M just puts a pointer into that array. So if you put a pointer into a stack-based buffer, uh, in this example here, as it shows you that buff is declared on the stack, and that's where it's declared, then the, um, when you, after you return from the function, your environment array has got a pointer to garbage in it, which is dangerous. Um, at some point, bad things will happen. And I have the suggestion, you set env, it, it's safer, as I understand it. And it, it, you know, if it, it could be safe to do it if you update the environment before the, the function e exits, but it seems dubious, it seems risky. This, well, this slide demonstrates another general feature, not just for the analyzer, but for diag the diagnostic subsystem. If you look at the, um, the warning line, so um, put env on pointed to automatic variable buff, you'll see pos34c. Now, I think in GCC, 10, I added the ability for diagnostics to have metadata, um, but the only metadata I supported was CWE codes. CWE is a, um, the common, weak, common weaknesses enumeration, and it's a sort of a sister database to the CVE database, so it was the common vulnerabilities and exposures um, um, database uh, from MITRE. And, and CW is a sort of taxonomy of different mistakes that it's possible to make in, in, in code. The idea being to try and say it, have a unique code for use after free or, um, I don't know, out of bounds access. And, um, but there are other taxonomies and there are, for example, there are coding standard guidelines. And so the one, one thing I've added in, G in GC13, and this is in trunk, is that the diagnostic metadata class can have just, you can add your own custom rules. And a rule basically has a name, which in this case is pos 34 c This is from the, um, what is it, the Carnegie Mellon Cert C secure coding guidelines saying do not, um, do not, which says do not call, um, uh, what is it, put env with a pointer to the stack. And so, yeah, okay, we can say it's a, an instance of that, of, uh, it's a violation of that rule in that, in that coding standard. And so that, that the name, it also carries with it a URL. And if you're in a sufficiently smart terminal, you can, you can if that will be underlined and you can click on it, it'll take you to um, Carnegie Mellon's um, page describing that particular problem. And also that information, because we have Serif output, Serif has support for taxonomies and rules and capturing that kind of metadata about a problem. Um, so we can say, here's a description of what's going wrong, here's how to fix it, here's, what, or here's why it's a problem, here's why you shouldn't do this, and, and how to mitigate it, and all that kind of good stuff. Where, and, that, and that's just like a click away in the terminal. I, for Google's Summer of Code this year, I've mentored two students um, who've both done a great job on, um, on their projects. Um, first, uh, first, I'll talk about it, uh, Tim Lange, I hope I'm pronouncing his surname correctly. And he's been looking at, um, looking at implementing warnings sort of based around the tracking of memory inside program states that we track inside the analyzer. And he's been testing these on, yeah, as I say, uh, the four, uh, core utils, curl, HTTPD, and OpenSSH to try and um, to try and make sure that we don't we get a decent um, uh, what I call signal to noise ratio, not too many false positives on real sort of idiomatic C code from a bunch of different open source projects. And so, first off. Um, 
Hopefully that doesn't get too small uh, on the font size. Dash W analyzer allocation size. And this looks, if you have an assignment to a pointer, and this is like, he's, if you're making this sort of int32 star, which he was, we, I guess we assume is a, a, an array of int32s, um, and we've got a malloc of n times size of int16, um, it's probably meant to be int32, not int16. Maybe there's a copy and paste error. Um, because that way you'll, you'll get this buffer that's a multiple, you know, an int32 star probably should be a multiple of four bytes in size. So you've got a, you know, an, a whole numbered set of int32s. But n times size of int16, is you'll, if, it, if n is odd, then you'll, the buffer will have only room for half of a int32 at the end. More, Okay, um, and um, I guess this is, I have, I, was saying, I have not implemented sound effects for GCC's diagnostic <laughs> subsystem. And that, that, that I feel would be, um, um, that, would, that would be suboptimal. Um, and, and, and so he's implemented this and you can see that the warning, and we're allocating n, well with a cast, n times two bytes and it's assigned to n32 star, which is size of four. And so that is bad. Um, and uh, is there a CW? there's a CWE code as well, as you can see, the, the metadata. And the, um, where was I going with that? that uh, and uh, and he as I say, he tested this on a bunch of real world code. And so there are various, um, he's tuned the warning for a lot of common cases like the trailing array member of structs. Um, so if we see that, uh, we just don't issue the warning because um, uh, where you have a struct that might have stuff hanging off the end is a reasonably common um, idiom in C. Um, so, um, and so this warns for things that are wrong like that, but not for, uh, I don't, for the, various fun the, ver the various things he, uh, he tested it on. As he was working on this, um, uh, one of the test cases we came up with was with what happens if you have pass in a float, um, floating point number into how big the allocation size should be. And um, which, well, first of all, it crashed the analyzer with an internal <laughs> compiler error, which obviously we didn't want to do. And he said, oh, we can fix this and put in a check. And I thought, well, it seems really dubious to be using a floating point number to, count, you know, to figure out how big your buffer should be. Because floating point, there are all kinds of Problem, I mean, uh, all kinds of problems with floating point. Uh, I mean, I don't think, I don't fully understand floating point. I mean, hands up here and who in the room fully understands floating point? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm on the point in the, the Dunning-Kruger curve where I know that I don't fully understand floating point. Um, and um, so the, where was I going? The, uh, <laughs> the, yeah, so, so he, we, he, he implemented a, basically anywhere we see a value being computed that makes its way to a size calculation, be it for a, a size of a malloc or the size of a copy of bytes or something like that. If floating point gets used, that seems dubious. So we have this new, it was originally dash W analyzer dash imprecise dash floating dash point dash arithmetic, um, which would be the, the new record for the length of a GCC option. Uh, although to be fair, I had already created one that I think was only two characters shorter. So, but I uh, said, so let's make it just dash FP arithmetic. So, so that's a, that, that one sort of fell out of that earlier patch. Uh, I don't know that if, if that'll ever fire, but it seems like don't, yeah, don't use floating point for calculating buffer sizes. That's weird and wrong. The, the, uh, but the thing he implemented that I'm most excited about is this dash W analyzer out of bounds, which is a bounds checker for the, uh, for, the, for the analyzer. Every single read and write to memory that's in the simulated, in the simulation the analyzer is doing, uh, is checked for, uh, is now bounds checked. His initial implementation was, uh, he's looking at the, or the, the analyzer is looking at for every, for every read or write, where is, the, where is the start of the access, where is the end of the access, and what is the relative to the memory region 
Um, I, and exactly what that means um, is complicated um, because you can have um, sort of symbolic regions for. Yeah, uh, I could go on a great length of talk to me after if you want to know about the implementation details of the analyzer, uh, but also the um, how, what is the capacity of this region because you could have a fixed size buffer, or you might know that the buffer is like four times n for some n that you've there's a symbolic value like the value of a parameter, uh, or more complicated symbolic expressions, and the um, his initial implementation um, checked for. Uh, out of bounds reads and writes where each of those three things, the offset for the start, the offset for the end, and the capacity of the what's being uh, um, accessed are const uh, sort of known constants rather than symbolic. But then he, he's generalized it um, for many cases of symbolic accesses. So here's an example of, um, we have a, a sort of a string struct, which is a length and then a variable length, um, a flexible array of char hanging off the end that we're allocating. Um, and so we have a malloc of uh, the size of that struct um, plus of the length of the string that we're doing. Um, I messed up the warning last week, unfortunately. You'll see those two messages about the capacity. And that, that's a bug I introduced, unfortunately, but I'm going to fix that. But you so said the capacity of this allocation is len plus eight bytes, the, the size of. And then, yeah, we do the error checking to check that we got a non null back from malloc. Um, and then, yeah, we populate the length field of the struct. And then, oh, let's set the the thing, the data field, this flexible array thing hanging off the end, and let's add a null terminator on the end. Well, oops, we forgot to add an extra byte in the malloc for the, for the, the zero terminator. Oh, uh, Thomas, you have your, uh, various people have their hand up, and uh, I think if you pass the microphone. I was just curious why it's uh, highlighting event four here, the len store into the string class. Uh, why the why the analyzer is highlighting or I'm um, outputting the event for the len store into the oh, it, it's it's anal it's highlighting that there is a control flow it's following the true branch of the if statement to that statement okay um, and so it's um, ideally there will be some ASCII art showing an arrow showing it's going from here to there. Um, and that's the only reason why it's highlighting line, line 15, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Right. That it's, because that's not relevant to the yeah. actual problem. It's purely a way of showing that the control flow is you've got a, you're going from line 14 and you're following the if, ah. if the if str is true, because str is, when str is non-null to line 15, it's mm. considering the case where the allocation succeeds. So that also covers line 16 then basically just to follow the, the execution Thread, yeah, yeah the, the way I print execution paths is I sort of, I try and show each event, and if the events are sufficiently close together, I just combine the, um, the, the, into a single, so you can see, here's a chunk of quoted source code to try and minimize the total amount of source code I'm spewing out at the user, although, I mean, it's often quite verbose. Um, but yeah, and at line 17, you see event five, it's the right of that byte is at offset len plus h8, which is one off the end of the buffer. And, and so this is in trunk. And so we have, and yeah, and I say he generalized it and it covers many cases where the start offset and the end offset of the access and the capacity, all three of those potentially can be symbolic. So you've got a len plus eight, where len is a, it's a parameter passed into this function. Um, so this is pretty cool. We've got a, uh, like a, a off by one um, bounds checking. It violet, finds this bounds, out of bounds problem. Um, and, it's, and it's symbolic, which I'm, I'm not sure we had before in the um, existing middle end warnings. And um, the wording could use some improvement. And I've got, um, I'm hoping for, um, well, certainly before the release of GCC 13, to do a big overhaul of the wording and try and catch some of the special cases so we can say it's an off by one and nice 
tweaks to that, although there's a bit of a combinatorial explosion of all the different possibilities. But I've got some ideas. There's a bug in uh, Bugzilla about that. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's a feature I'm very excited about. Um, so the, my other Summer of Code student, I'm waiting for time here, um, Imad Mir, he was looking at, um, he's been looking at file descriptor APIs. And he's added five new warnings that are in trunk and three new attributes for describing so you can mark up functions to say that, they, that a particular int parameter of a function is in fact a file descriptor and expects a, you know, an open sane file descriptor or maybe one that's open specifically for reading or specifically for writing. And he's also special cased of a, in the analyzer of knowledge about the behavior of certain common functions, open, well, the ones I show on the slide. Uh, and he, he's working on, I think, currently working on pipe. Um, and there's a bunch more in, in Bugzilla. So the first warning he's implemented, or he's implemented various ones. The first I'll talk about is analyzer FD use without check. So here in this example, line six, we have an old fire descriptor. We try and duplicate it. And, and then we use it at line seven on the read call, but we haven't done any kind of error checking on it. And so what we're doing with this sort of state machine is all file descriptors are being tracked with, and we know that this, is a, this has been attempted to be opened, but we haven't yet done any error checking on it. So it's in sort of in that state in the state machine. So when we see the read, it passed to the read call, we say FD could be invalid, it's unchecked. Here's where it comes from at event one. Um, so presumably you want to put some sort of error checking in, in between the, the dup2 and the read. Um, we're also within the state machine, we're tracking, if we know it, whether the file script was opened read only or write only. So we see at line six, f is opened read only. Um, and then we have various events where, where rather verbosely we say that error checking has occurred, uh, assuming that it's valid when we follow the F is not negative one path. And then at line five, when we're trying to write to F, through F, uh, we can complain, well, it's a write on a read-only file descriptor with dash def analyzer FD access mode mismatch. So that's another new one that's new in GCC 13. We have a double close checker. So if a file descriptor gets closed, we transition it to the closed state in our state machine. And so, yeah, we have the, the first close is a line seven. And oops, we close it again. Maybe it's a copy and we were a bit, um, we accidentally copied a line, or maybe there's a merge conflict, and uh, there's a second close, event three, and there's, here's where the first close was. Or maybe there's a more complicated control flow, and it will be showing you that and where the different closes happen. And finally, and this is, I don't know, and for me, I feel this is the most important one, is um, because file descriptors reflect a resource that is being, con uh, for the process. Um, if you don't clean them up, that will, that's a leak, and that's a leak of a real resource that will gradually, um, you know, you'll eventually run out of them. And so at line six, we open um, a file script and store it in FD. And if we don't, and if that val symbolic value never uh, gets stored anywhere and we fall off the end of the function here at line seven, we can complain that FD is leaking here, and here's where it's opened. Maybe you have an error handling path where you forgot to clean up. Um, oh yeah, and use after close. If you, here's an example of one of the attributes where you, we, we've closed FD and then we pass it to function F, and we know that, and we're complaining that F is being called past this this closed file descriptor. Here's where it's closed at event one, and F and we note has been marked up with this new attribute FD arg, and what we're, that is saying is that FD arg one means that argument one of F. Is that is expected to be uh, an open file descriptor, and you know it's expected to, and that actually says this is expected, this int is expected to be an open file descriptor that's been checked, that's been error checked from wherever it came from, and we'll issue those other all the various warnings I've already showed you if it if it's already been closed or if if it's the wrong access mode because yeah, there, there are three of these there's FDR and there's also FDR read and FDR write to say this is expected to be as well as being open and and error checked it's also expected to have been opened for reading or opened for writing so that we can complain if you um, 
So yeah, and, and it's, it's, I guess it makes it easier if, you, if you've copied and pasted and you've messed up, like you've got one file descriptor for reading and one for writing and you get them confused. Um, it, this, that, that would help with that. So th that's the file descriptor stuff. And all of this is in shrunk for GCC 13. And uh, I, I've been playing around with a few other warnings. Um, I've been playing around with the deref before check, which looks for if a pointer gets dereferenced, to basically say if that pointer that was dereferenced is then checked for, was it null or not? Um, well, was, if, it's, if, it, if you're checking that it's null, maybe you shouldn't have dereferenced it already, um, because if it is null, you're going to get a crash. And also because the optimizer, GCC optimizers, I believe, will assume that if you're, oh, you're dereferencing that? It can't be null, and it might actually eliminate, optimize away the null check. Um, and which I, sus I think some of our users get unhappy with. But, so I've been experimenting with this, and unfortunately I, um, I haven't yet got it. I've got it working for some simple cases, um, but there's a fair amount of work to do before it, I, I would want to, to... For example, it, it doesn't work well with um, interprocedurally, because you might, might dereference a pointer and then call a support function where you pass that pointer in. And that support function might allow for accept null pointers and have a, a check within it, at which point you've checked something that you've already referenced. But it's in, a, it's in a different function. So there's a sort of aspect of what is the, sort of the, 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 the scope of that, of, of that warning. And also, it, um, I've got some implementation details where it explodes the complexity of the analysis. So I don't know if I get that in. Uh, next, um, I want to solve the halting problem. Uh, <laughs> 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 joke. Um, and um, so I work it, I've been playing around with a dash, yeah, a dash infinite recursion and dash infinite loop um, warnings. Um, and more seriously, um, the, 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 the case here is if you have Say you do, you got you, you write four int i equals blah 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 i less than blah blah blah, and then you say, oh, I'll I'll do a nested loop, and then you copy and paste four j equals blah 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 blah, and as, but in, within that blah blah blah, I just said, yeah, you forgot to update the i plus plus incrementing i, and that you've got a second increment of i in the inner for loop, and so j in your inner loop isn't changing at all. And you'll never leave that loop. And uh, can we detect that statically? Um, and, and I have a prototype for working for some simple cases. The problem with that I've ran into was that sometimes you get, in terms of GCC's internal represent representation, just a basic block that's empty, no statements at all, with a, um, just looping back on itself. And at that point, well, what's the source location of that when you report it to the user? There's no statements. And only some edges in our control flow graph have location information. I think, I think we have a location T value in our edge type for control flow graph. But we only ever populated it for a few things. And would it be a problem if, if we populated it more, because that might be useful for that. And I'm watching people's facial expressions, and I'm not quite sure if I'm getting a read. The other is I've structured inside the analyzer, I've structured the way I handle diagnostics. So everything assumes there is a Gimple statement that a diagnostic is associated with. And there's a bunch of other information. But I kind of feel I'm going to need to generalize it to just working on locations, because there might not be a statement for this kind of thing. It's more of a control flow graph-based thing. And um, one of my summer code students, Tim, ran into another issue where he wanted to say, I think it was, yeah, it was on, a, on a function call statement. He was saying, well, sometimes I want to express the warning on the parameter, and sometimes I want to express a warning on the assignment of the return code to the left-hand side of the call. And I, you know, and, and it's like, oh yeah, I, I need, I, you know, we need to overhaul this. So that, I'm, there's some sort of internal workings that I meant to do there. The um, Tim, my summer of code student, also experimented with a, a, an analyzer version of the a restrict warning, and we ran into an issue. Um, so this isn't in trunk. This one. So say you've got this function h. It takes a size and three pointers. 
Uh, if you ignore the function body for now, and you say, well, but you notice that the three func um, pointers have all been marked restrict. What does that mean? Um, and I'm not, and, I have, and we were looking at the C standard. We were also looking at this new draft um, update to the standard that has changed, uh, add, added some clarifying paragraphs to the meaning of restrict. Now, I believe dash w restrict currently will warn, if we pass H and say, let's call H and pass in 100, and we pass in A, B, and B again. Now, the, the, those final parameters have been marked restrict. Are we allowed to pass the same array as parameters three and four, given that it's been marked with restrict? Um, I believe GCC's current implementation of dash W restrict and, and Tim's implementation of dash W analyzer restrict says you can't do that because it's marked restrict and you've got an aliasing, but B and B are the same thing. But our reading of this updated draft of the C standard seems to suggest, well, actually, if you look at the body of H, those Q and R, those final things, well, they're only ever read from. There isn't a real problem, so this is well-defined, and you've got your hand up. Um, I knew this would get. <laughs> I just would add that in Fortran, this is correct. And hmm. Fortran was the idea to introduce strict pointers, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Fortran, do, Fortran does this much better. So the argument for this being correct is that B and B would be just read from, right? And not written to. Mm, yeah, they're, they're merely read from, but yeah. you need to see the inside of the function to know yeah, that. Which, yeah, I would agree with that reading, yeah. It's, it's, I, I'm sorry? I would agree with the reading uh, of it, so that, that. Which reading? That it is not worth warning here, or that the warning would be incorrect here, because it's only read from. That we should warn or that we shouldn't warn? We should not warn. We should not warn. Yeah. Okay. Because that makes it much more... That was our feeling that well, we weren't quite which sure... Is often, which is, of course, surprising indeed. I would yeah. Know. And that's yeah. why this is not in trunk, because we have this, I don't know... Well, actually, and, we warn about many things which, in fact, are correct to do, right? So we could warn, because it's certainly uh, in, 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 uh, a bad style, right, mm. in this case. Yeah, arguably, well, I think as a, we have this attribute access where we can document that this is only read from, yeah. uh, and maybe we could use that. I'm not sure. Uh, if I move on, um, yeah, I've made some internal improvements to the analyzer. Um, I refactoring how I track call string, which is a detail of um, interprocedural analysis, which um, should hopefully eventually allow me to have a less bad implementation of how I summarize the effects of calls. That's a way of avoiding the, anal the analysis, ex anal analysis exploding. Um, I, the analyzer runs pretty late compared to most static analysis tools are sensible and run on as close to the user's view of the code as possible. Like basically, it, on the, they take the um, abstract syntax tree coming out of the, um, the, the front end and work using that. Um, I was lazy and I'm using the um, Gimple SSA representation at the point where um, LTO um, is either spat out or read from because I wanted to piggyback on that sort of cross translation unit um, LTO thing so I can do link time analysis. Um, but the, the, and that win buys me some things because um, the optimizers have already gotten to work on the code a bit and we can potentially analyze a bit deeper. Uh, but unfortunately, the optimizers have already gotten to work on the code and, um, the, and it means, for example, some inlining has already happened. And so showing you those sort of interprocedural, this gets called and that gets called, in before GCC 13, that could look really confusing if inlining has happened. And so in Shrunk for GCC 13, I've done some, it does some fix-ups so it can sort of look at the inlining, recorded chain of inlining information that we store so that it can sort of reconstruct and there's a call to this and a call to this and so on. So you can kind of get the sense of, uh, of, of what, the, what inlining was done. Um, and it, hopefully it may, it, it's closer to the user's view of the code rather than the, the optimizer's view of the code. Um, I've extended 
are the GCC, the plugin hook. So you can, a GCC plugin can now tell the analyzer, this specific named function behaves in this specific way. For example, it has to consider it has a success case and a failure case, and on this case, it does this to memory and has this recite, these constraints on the return code, and in the failure case, it does that. So you can, you can if you have an API that you want to teach it about, you can, you can kind of go to town without needing like very, very custom attributes. You can actually just program directly into the analyzer's internals with a plugin. And I've also been trying to use std unique pointer because I have a bunch of places in the analyzer where I say, this, is owned, this pointer is owned by the thing, whereas this is merely borrowed. And now that we can use C11 internally, it seems, well, maybe we should use C11 for expressing that this is an owned thing, this pointer. Um, and, one, and that sort of stalled because C11 adds std unique pointer, but the very useful make unique is C14. And so we need a sort of compat thing there somewhere in our source tree. And we kind of got bogged down exactly where that should land. But I think we just need to decide which, which color the bike shed should be um, and, get that, and get that in. Um, actually, talking about that, um, right now, to use std unique pointer, you need to include memory. Now, but before you do that, you have to do this. We don't do that. We have to def do hash define include memory right at the top of the source, the particular CC file. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. And it's a major pain in the backside because um, if you change a header to use a std unique pointer, every source file that includes that header um, in G inside GCC needs to modify it because I think we're poisoning a a token. This is, I'm diving deep into the weeds, and I, um, we can t may, I, I'll bring this up on the mailing list, uh, but it, it annoys me. Um, and yeah, the other thing I've been doing, um, as well as all these sort of general improvements, is trying uh, to build the Linux kernel with Dash F Analyzer. And so I've been building custom GC, um, GCC anal analyzer trees and then hacking up the kernel adding at my custom attributes and whatnot, and um, trying to find problems. And um, I found lots and lots of problems in the analyzer doing this. The Linux kernel makes a great, um, it's big and complicated, and, um, it, and therefore it, it shows up lots of problems. Many, some false positives, some just crashes, and others where the analyzer would just go off into the weeds and I'd sort of kill it after 20 minutes going, yeah, something's, it shouldn't take that long. And I fixed most of those. Uh, the one outstanding one near the top 1062.18, where um, the kernel internally, it likes to do error handling, Why right? there are many functions that return a pointer, but also potentially an error code that's a small negative value that's been stuffed into that pointer with a cast. Hmm. Uh, Aldi, and you, you, yeah. Did you find any real bugs in the kernel with your with the analyzer? I found a, a, a exposure of un, uninitialized data. So the question: Did I find any real bugs? I found an exposure of un, exposure of uninitialized data um, from the user space, but only in a test a sample module. That's not in. There's not an actual production module. It's more example code. Although arguably the example code should be correct. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, I've got the one outstanding bug where I need to teach my constraint handler that, you know, we get a false positive because we see this path in the code and this path in the code. I need, and the, there's a component within the analyzer which basically decides that, no, the, the, that combination of conditions is impossible. Um, so I, I hope to teach it that, but we get a lot of false positives from that right now. I've also, you know, running out of time here, been looking at um, the boundary between user space and kernel space. So what kernel specific warnings can I add? Uh, so here's an example of um, inside a module, you might have a copy, copy some data command from user. We look at the, um, we do a bounds check to see is it um, below the size of an array and then we write through the array, but oops, that command on index, it's a signed integer, not an unsigned integer. So that an attacker could pass an un, a, a negative value and use that to inject a write um, to manipulate kernel memory. And so I can warn about that. And the question is, how do I teach 
or how do the, the how what how do we mark up the kernel so that we know about that this is untrusted information coming um, in one direction, and then the other direction, an information leak, where this is, this is the, the last, I have an exposure through uninit copy, where I have a, <laughs> there is a strange Cylon it's, it's thing it's looking, it's thing. okay, whatever, um, where a, a buffer is being copied back to user space, and I'm noting there's like three bytes of, so I have a warning that can detect this. I'm checking whether things are initialized at the per bit level, into procedurally, and so that on this execution path, which is a very simple one, there's three bytes of padding that haven't been written to, and potentially that contains secret information that the attacker might be trying to get back out via a system call. And I, yeah, I had a, did a talk about this at LPC earlier this week, and there's a kind of question of how do I, how do we in GCC provide features that are going to be useful to the Linux kernel community? Um, and, and how do they consume that? I think we can't just throw stuff over the wall every year and say, here, have at it. Um, and I, ha my, I did have a huge, like, 2,000, 3,000 line patch, and the solution I've come up with is, well, I don't, they don't like GCC plugins. I don't really like GCC plugins, but at least it can, I can make it a small plugin, and by moving much of this functionality into GCC and the analyzer itself, hence we have this new warning, but you can't do it unless right now, get that warning, the info leak warning, unless you use a custom plugin to teach the, teach the, the, um, the analyzer that this function works in this way. And so I've been looking at, um, and the kernel has hundreds of thousands of annotations to talk about, is this a user space pointer versus is it a kernel space pointer? I've been looking at extending GCC support for custom address spaces to add that, and I got a couple of ideas, and I posted a bad patch for that back in November that broke a bunch of back-end code, or would have done, but obviously we didn't do that. I got a much better implementation that I haven't posted yet that I hope to get in for GCC 13, and maybe an attribute no D, I used to, it's no deref, not node ref, meaning this is a pointer that can't be dereferenced, and you have your hand up and the your microphone. But running out of time here. Very quickly. Uh, so you target uh, inputs that uh, are out of bound for things like get user, uh, copy from user. So you do you intend to cover things like uh, specter mitigations? Yeah, um, that would require yeah, the question, could you do specter mitigations using um, this taint analysis, I guess? And the answer is possibly, yeah. Because right now I'm looking at it, do you have a particular, yeah, are you checking using greater than or less than on, on the bounds? But I think for, you need a special um, custom thing to like do a, do a, um, do a specter safe check of this, uh, of this particular index that, to avoid the sort of, is it side channel attack or I can't remember the um, And so that is a possibility, yeah. Um, someone brought that up um, after my talk at LPC actually, so um, great idea. Um, and so, yeah, so we're running out of time. So, yeah, in summary, yeah, so I talked about um, some general improvements to GCC's diagnostics, so serialization, being able to save and load diagnostics, metadata. Yeah, if you're writing a plugin that implements a, code, you know, a coding standard checker, um, like one of the MIS or automotive things or whatnot, you could, you could mark up your warnings that way and with links to particular um, violated rules. Um, the new warnings. And, uh, very, and all of that. And I, I really enjoy the analyzer. It's fun. Um, if you're, if hopefully this is exciting and people think, oh, this is cool, I want to work on it. We have lots of ideas for new warnings in Bugzilla. Or maybe you want to add warnings for your own. Uh, you can think of an API that you, would be a good fit. If you can model it as a state machine or um, maybe it's a good fit for how we're tracking memory, that would be good. So come and talk to me uh, here or on the mailing list. So, um, kind of out of time for questions. Well, we had some questions along the way. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, Aldi. Well, maybe we've got two minutes. Uh, well, it's two minutes till 11. Um, how many of the existing middle end warnings can you remove or replace with your, with your work? Um, so, yeah, we have these existing middle end warnings, like with a string op, um, overflow, and so on and so forth. Array bounds. Array bounds that, are, that are based on the Gimpel SSA implementation and the value range information that you're 
tweaking and the ranger work. And previously I thought that would be a big job, but I've been quite encouraged by Tim's work on his, the out of bounds thing to think maybe we can do, maybe we can replace them. Um, I, I want to try, um, but obviously it's a big job. Uh, I'd like to ask about the allocation size warning, if it's a good fit for, for analyzer, if it shouldn't be something in the front end, because in the front end, the optimizations have, haven't changed the expression, so, so loose uh, at, at the analyzer point, whether it was shifted by one or and multiplied by two or, or something similar. Uh, in the front end, you can see it was size of, of, of this type or if it, it was two or... And, mm. and usually people write the cast directly in the, uh, in the same statement, so... That may be a valid criticism, yes. Um, I'm... The one advantage of doing it in the analyzer is you've got potentially you've got the sort of the path-based, um, well, I was going to say you could also, there, there's some sort of compound expression, um, but you, you've got that in the AST as well. So, yeah, um, maybe it is in the wrong place. Um, but on the other hand, this, this is implemented and, and works. If you want to implement it in the front end as well, be my guest, I guess. That's a, that's a um, I know there's a bit of a lazy answer by me, sorry. <laughs> All right, and I think we're, well, it's 11 o'clock, so um, time for the so next one, session. So one last question, if there is any. Oh, good. Yeah. right on time. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> um, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess